God bless hairband wigs. Now I don't have to go anywhere bald headed. I always have a choice, <laughs> but will I take it? Who knows? Hi. <laughs> Hello, it's Kendo here. If you're new around here, welcome. And if you're not new around here, what is up? Home skillet biscuit. And happy Saturday. If you don't know what Saturday is, Saturday is generally when I do <laughs> 2020, that's the only excuse I need. But Saturday is generally when I do a little something called Bad Movies in a Beat, the series on my channel where I talk about bad movies while putting my makeup on. Last time we did a reaction style video of a movie that just simply should never have been made. Like we could have gone this entire lifetime, this entire millennia and never seen Jesus Christ Vampire Hunter. Riveting tale, truly. But despite the movie being as much of a talking point as it could have been, I feel like most people were more <laughs> interested in the dilemma I posed in the beginning of the video. That being that I had a mouse, rat, a rouse, a mat problem. Uh, of which I uh, explained in great detail in my last video, not last Bad Movies in a Beat, but the last video. So if you wanna hear the tale of Philip, I named him Philip, uh, you can watch my last video, not the last Bad Movies in a Beat. But anyway, if you wanna see the last Bad Movies in a Beat, you can check that out up above, or you can check that out in the Bad Movies and a Beat playlist. Yes. Today we're uncovering a movie from my mental Rolodex that I always said I wanted to watch, but I just never got around to it. This is another film of which I was made aware of due to my friend Miyosha. Shout outs to Miyosha. Miyosha was inadvertently the beginning of my love for movies because I went over her apartment and she was always playing something. <laughs> Last time we talked about a movie, she had me watching, it was uh, The Man in 3B. I also did a Bad Movies in a Beat on that, so if you wanna check that out, that'll also be up above. This one was playing when I came over her apartment and I only saw the last like 10 minutes of it and I said, wow, that sounds terrible. Um, I should watch that. And here we are like three years later and I never got around to it. But since then, I've had a countless amount of people recommending the 2008 horror comedy, quote unquote, horror comedy known as Teeth, which is the story of a young woman named Dawn who has teeth, upper hoo-ha. And like I said, I had, I had heard of this movie, I'd heard of the premise of this movie, but I had yet to watch it until making this video and I made the ghastly mistake of watching it in its entirety for the first time in public at the gym, actually. Shout outs to my gym, actually. There's like two people in there at all times, including you. And it's like, wow, this is safer than going to the grocery store. This is nice. <laughs> anyway, yeah, I watched it in public. Don't recommend it. Don't, don't do that. Now, before I get fully into this movie, I would like to verbally warn people about it, particularly if you are triggered by things related to sexual assault. Usually I like to take the chance to say, hey, disclaimer, these are some themes that will be in the movie, but this one, it's a core element, it's a core trope. So I am gonna say verbally, just take the chance to say, if that is something that is bothersome to you, particularly triggering for you, I would sit this one out. The movie's not good, you're not missing a lot. <laughs> so sit this one out, join me for a midweek video. We talk about like existentialism and salads and stuff like that. It's a fun time. If you just wanna hear me talk, then just, you know. But yeah, the movie ain't even good. It's not worth your mental health, sis. So anyway, our main character is a teenage girl named Dawn. Dawn is sort of a spokesperson, a youth leader type thing in an organization that's focused on abstinence and purity and purity rings and all that. She has a stepbrother whom we learn very early is a little douche nugget. Actually, in the opening scene, we learn a few things about the dynamic in relation to Brad and Dawn. One, again, Brad is a douche nugget. Try to be friends, okay? No, God damn it. Hey. Two, Brad is particularly unsatisfied or particularly disgruntled that his dad and her mom got married because he didn't want Dawn as his sister. Don't splash your sister. She ain't my sister. Pretty much cemented very early that this is because he liked her, was in love with her, what have you, very young. And three, Brad is a fucking creeper, like early. Let's see yours now. The opening scene to just set the stage of how uncomfortable this entire movie is, is Brad as a small child touching Dawn inappropriately while they're in a kiddie pool. It results in Dawn biting his 
finger with her down there teeth. And therefore, for the rest of his life, he has this scar where he almost lost the tip of his finger because he was touching somebody where he shouldn't have been touching them. Teach him early, I say. <laughs> I'm just saying he learned his lesson. You learn the fire is hot when you get burned. But this is very early in which we learn that Dawn is unconventional. He has a, a particular skill, an adaptation, if you will. She has an abnormality, which may prove to be quite advantageous throughout the rest of the movie. Spoiler alert. But yes, this moment is quite pivotal. Probably the reason why as a teenager, she is so vocal about being an abstinence proponent due to the dangers. <laughs> involved in in the vagina if you used your hand on yourself do you think that's pure i call it target practice <laughs> while she's in this group she ends up meeting a jonas brother floppy hair looking dude he has a name i think it's toby but he's gonna be known as floppy head easier for me to remember wait didn't the jonas brothers also have purity rings at one point wasn't that a thing was that the joke they were trying to make Ew. From the jump gives me weirdo vibes. He's just standing a little too close to people that he's never met. But due to the awkward and obscene close-ups, we're supposed to believe that he's in some way significant, that they are having this inexplicable attraction very early. But the thing is very early, I knew he was a weirdo because he don't blink enough for me. My theory, I don't know if this is true, but the theory I have is that evil people don't blink enough because they're thinking of all the evil shit they wanna do. So they don't remember to do like basic human function. Think about it. When have you ever felt comfortable with someone staring at you without blinking? Not a single time. But yeah, I knew he was gonna be full of some garbage before the movie could even really get started. There's a blink quota. Now in the present, it is really solidified that Dawn and her stepbrother Brad are complete extremes. She's so pure and so demure and so ladylike and untouched and unviolated that she has to have like a whole soundtrack about it. Well, Brad is a metal blasting, sexed up, drug induced antichrist that stays in the same home in the same confines. While at school, Dawn is often teased for being a part of the, you know, Christian abstinence group, which is not cool. I'm not a fan of that. I will never be a proponent of that. I feel like if you're gonna be loud and vocal about women choosing how to express their sexuality, you must also respect women who decide to not have sex. Especially in high school. If you having sex with high school boys, it's a bad pussy investment. Again, teenage boys have nothing to offer you. They're not mature in any way. They have no money. They are bad at sex. It's a lose, 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 lose situation. Don't worry about teenage boys. They are not important. You gotta get on birth control. You gotta get an IUD. You gotta do something to make sure you're not having his broke big head babies. You get nothing, sis. Bad investment. Put your pussy in low risk stock. <laughs> get an IRA for your pussy. <laughs> anyway, at school, they have a less than educational sex education class, which is actually pretty on mark, in which they show them having a class on the human anatomy, particularly around the genital area. And they're very open and expressive about the male reproductive system looks like and how it performs and what have you. But when they get to the female reproductive organs, they elect to, for some reason, put just a sticker over it so that you can't see any of, <laughs> any of the parts. Now, as ludicrous and stupid as that sounds, that does not shock me. I feel like that might've actually happened. I feel like somewhere, I'm feeling like Nebraska. So, somewhere in one of those states that you forget are states. My, sorry, Nebraskans, but. And then when the students start to question why they aren't allowed to see the female reproductive system and learn about that, the, the teacher has trouble explaining why it's different, like why they can't learn about it. And here comes this chick, I was defending you, I was trying to be there for you, but you gotta play, you gotta be stupid. She's like, girls have a natural modesty. It's built into our nature, it's so depicting. Me <laughs> too. <laughs> Look, I'm a proponent of adults, particularly, having as much consensual, responsible, and safe sex as they would like to have. But one of the things that I think back on, because I, I, I wasn't, it wasn't this extreme in my school system, but it was certainly, it was certainly something they lightly glossed over, is this idea of keeping children ignorant to their own bodies for some weird BS about modesty. I got really, really serious all of a sudden, but I just, I, that's what I do in these.
if you're new to that's what I do. We take a funny and we turn it into not funny and then go back to funny. Especially for teenagers who many of which are already sexually active, you're keeping them unaware of how to be the best advocate for themselves sexually and non-sexually in their newly forming relationships. And even if they're not having sex, they still have these parts. <laughs> have no clue on how to advocate for their health. But she is, that's all, allow me to descend from my soapbox. But more incidental to this story, this becomes an issue because Dawn's never seen another vagina. <laughs> So she doesn't know there's not supposed to be teeth in it. So she's just like, oh yeah, everyone has chompers in their hoop. <laughs> okay, so Brad has a girlfriend or like a girl that he sees regularly and has sex with. Uh, we don't learn a lot about her other than they have a lot of sex, particularly doing butt stuff. And I'm to assume that the reason why Brad only wants to partake in that particular form, I'm, I'm, Speaking around it because I'm sure I'm really trying to work on not getting demonetized in this video. It's too late. I assume the reason why he only does this is because um, he believes that it may be dangerous. Hence, you know, when he was a kid, he got, you know. I sat there thinking, okay, he's supposed to be, again, this rebel, devil may care, pill popping, sex having lunatic, right? But the thing is, wouldn't such a man have seen pornography and seen that, you know, most acts of sex don't result like in your dick going in a pepper grinder. Like, I don't know. I'm not supposed to ask questions. Back to Dawn. She nearly touches herself in the no-no square because she's hot and bothered by the thought of floppy hair. She doesn't do it because she remembers the possible danger ahead. My wig. Oh no. Dawn is struggling with her thoughts of purity and floppy hair is feeling the same. At the end of which they elect to no longer see each other, even in groups, even in very, very large groups, which just seems like, okay, if your thing is you don't wanna have sex until you're married, wouldn't you at some point have to meet someone? Like how, <laughs> like logistics, like I don't understand theory, you're marrying this person, so at some point you're gonna have to be alone with someone you really, really, really like. I don't understand. Brad and Dawn have a quick conversation I'm still not really understand what prompted this, but basically Dawn is like, I wish we could be like brother and sister. Like we've never had like a good brother and sister relationship. And this dude is over here like, you know why? Alluding to them having like this unspoken sexual attraction, which this is all you, you weirdo. I know we've never been close. We've never been like sister and brother. And I really don't know why that sure is. I really don't. I'd like for it to change. You know, all that abstinence bullshit. We all know who you've been saving yourself for. Somebody cue the banjo. <laughs> you know, fuck my sister on. <laughs> Soon thereafter, Dawn gets over her reservations of being alone with um, Floppy. And they go to the river on some middle America. We ain't got nothing else better to do bullshit. They go down to the old swimming hole while they frolic in the water. They share their first kiss, which is all good until he starts grabbing a titty. In which case she exclaims, purity. They end up in a nearby cave in which they again continue to make out until Toby commences to sexually assault her. Which they show pretty much entirely. It's, it's pretty graphic. <laughs> and there's a point within the scene in which Floppy exclaims something along the lines of like, I haven't masturbated since Easter, which I'm still trying to understand, was that supposed to be funny? I'm trying to see where the funny is. Like, I'm not understand, where's the joke? Yes, he commences to sexually assault her. And um, maybe this is supposed to be the funny part where her, her coochie chompers bites her, his dick off, like clean off <laughs> in half, like severs it. And if, and you see it, they show it, <laughs> it falls to the ground. It looks like a Vienna sausage. Falls in the water and presumably drowns or dies from the blood loss. That's pretty funny. <laughs> if every rapist got their sh bitten off, I would not, I would not be opposed to that. The world would continue to spin quite gracefully, actually. But anyway, yeah, she goes home, has a whole existential crisis about her lethal labia. Still reeling from the events of her sexual assault, is preparing to go to another one of her abstinence public speaking situations and she's really not mentally there. She goes to give her speeches. She has a really rough time, kind of gets a little delusional. But while she's having a particularly rough time, she ends up running into another floppy hair guy. I'll call him Floppy Two. Floppy Two gives her a ride home 
And what they kind of do is try to paint him as this shy, reserved, the underdog, the guy that really likes her and would treat her right and yada, yada, yada. And he asks her out. She kind of like non-responds, but she doesn't really like say, yeah, I'll go out with you. Soon thereafter, Dawn goes back to where she was assaulted to see if floppy number one is actually dead. While she's there, she ends up seeing a crab eating his tin. Again, I'm struggling to see the problem here. Anyway, while she's there, she ends up taking the momentous decision to throw her purity ring off a cliff and into the water. And when she gets home, she decides to put her um, sex ed book underwater so that she can remove the sticker so that she can finally see what everyone else's vagina looks like and come to find out they indeed don't have dentures. So she then goes on a search, Bella Swan style, in which she wants to learn about the folklore of a vagina with teeth, which she soon learns that it's actually a pretty prominent figure in a lot of different forms of folklore, referred to as vagina dentata. Now we've gotten this far in the movie and when you hear the premise of like a vagina with teeth, you might think, oh, this is supposed to be a hear me out film. For those of you that know, you know, whatever. But this is the prime reason why I did not decide to elect this movie as actually a hear me out film. I feel like some guy actually heard about this. <laughs> like the actual folklore, because it does exist. I looked it up. From South America to Western Asia, parts of Iran. It appears in Hinduism, certain parts of Maori mythology. So yeah, I learned it is a thing. Upon searching the most infallible source of information on the internet, Wikipedia, I found out that actually vagina dentata, is that how you pronounce it? I don't know. Was actually a lore meant to discourage rape. And again, I'm with it. But in the particular folklore that this movie seems to focus on, there is a premise of this demonic figure within the female anatomy having to be conquered by a valiant man. And that's the premise, the idea that someone must conquer the teeth. Soon thereafter, Dawn takes a, a way belated trip to the gynecologist <laughs> and she has a male gynecologist. I must say, me personally, if you feel comfortable with a male gynecologist, that's totally up to you. Me personally, I've never liked the idea of a man telling me how much something is gonna hurt in regards to my reproductive system or how I should feel, how it will feel, you know, certain things in relation to like how I should be affected. Sir, you are the proprietor of a penis. I do not wanna hear your thoughts on how I should feel. Cause I sit there and I'm like, you had any specialization you could go into. I understand they're professionals and they're probably great, whatever, but I just, ah. Granted, if you went into gynecology planning to look at vaginas all day, it's not all healthy vaginas going into a gynecologist. Anyway, she goes to a gynecologist and like every man in this movie, why am I trying to line my lips and talk at the same time? He too is a rapist. So um, he starts to sexually assault her with his hand while giving her an exam. And then the Gorilla Grip 4000 rips his fingers off. Again, I'm trying to see the issue. I am a proponent of rapists losing appendages. I feel like if we can figure this out on a systematic level, then there's hope for humanity. If we can figure it out, how to make rapists lose body parts. We just might be able to save this sinking ship we know as society. After her vagina resulting in another casualty. <laughs> ain't no casualty, ain't no victim. After the pussy put in work, Dawn is again distraught. She ends up going to floppy dude two's house. She goes to see him. She starts going on dubious about having killed another person. For some reason, he's not concerned enough for me, vagina dentata, and I, it must be conquered, and I killed two people, and <laughs> and instead of thinking, yo, this girl might need, she might need a professional, he's just like, I'm here for you. Relax, take a bath, here's a pill for anxiety. In the meantime, he's the nice floppy, so he's lighting candles, he's preparing. For some reason, he just seems very presumptuous, like what, who said anybody was having sex? I'll take care of you. He brings out unintimidating toys, uses protection, asks for consent. And comparatively, he's the least of all the evils we've seen thus far. So she's like, okay, but beware the teeth, you know, whatever. And come to find out, the teeth don't bite when you ask for consent, apparently. 
So we've we've cracked the code. Again, I am not opposed to this. Let's do this. Let's get this ball rolling, science people. Sounds grand, I would invest. Lo and behold, the nice floppy is actually not as nice as you think he is. He actually only wanted to have sex with her because he had an ongoing bet, if I'm not mistaken, with her stepbrother that he'd be able to have sex with her and make her give up her sacred promise of abstinence. Once she finds that out, cause he was really a dick about it. Cause he just like mid pump, I had a bet that I could get you to have sex with me. And so she uses her Venus fly trap and she, I'm not seeing where the problem is. This power could be misused. However, I still think the pros outweigh the cons. So leaning towards the end of this movie, I haven't really mentioned this thus far cause it wasn't really important until now, but Dawn's mom has been terminally ill through the entire movie. At one point in the film, she finds her mom passed out on the floor, even though her brother was home and did not do anything about it because he was in the middle of having sex with his girlfriend. Presumably dies or just gets really, really sick, but I think she dies, I'm, they don't really specify. Don finds out that Brad had actually heard her screaming, but said to ignore her because she does that all the time. And she finds that out from his girlfriend or the girl that he's having sex with a lot. And as you can imagine, that sends her over the edge. She's like, okay. So what does she do? She puts on some mascara, puts on a cute little dress, and she goes to her stepbrother's room and decides to weaponize the WAP for revenge. It's a weird situation. I'm not gonna, <laughs> I'm so tired of being in situations during bad movies in a beat where I have to say, well, technically it's not incest at this, it, it is, <laughs> it is. Like if you are by blood or socially performing as their sibling, they are your sibling. I, I'm very concerned about this being an ongoing trope. I, I just feel like somewhere y'all are trying to rationalize this. And I just, I'm concerned, like what is going on? But alas, she uses her coochie bear trap to snap his wee wee off. She rips off his tip, his dog chews on it. That was kind of funny. As he just screamed in dismay. I actually got a nice hefty chortle out of that one, not gonna lie. And Dawn rides her bike into the sunset, after which she hitchhikes. She ends up in a car with a gross old rapey man because every man is a rapist in this movie. It's really sad actually, which is gross and confusing because like even consensually, I don't think that dude would be able to survive intercourse anyway, even if she didn't have like the jaws of life. The movie ends with her turning to the camera, nodding and smiling knowingly, and then comes the credits. In conclusion, I'm down with the pussy pinchers. Science is a marvel. We can really do some weird shit. I personally vote for it. I feel like it's very advantageous. As far as this movie, ew. Um, I'm still thoroughly horrified by the concept of it being a comedy. Well, I guess, I guess watching rapists get body parts taken off is kind of funny, but it's hard to even enjoy that because there's so much graphic sexual assault. Hard to find the humor after you've just watched something as triggering as that. It's a movie. I watched it. Uh, do I recommend it? Not really. I, I mean, if you can stomach it, I guess it's worth one watch. I wouldn't, I certainly wouldn't watch it as many times as I had for the, for the sake of this video, but it's a conversation piece. Like, would you vote in favor of proposal two in which we allow women to elect to get a procedure that allows them to have a, a um, Venus fly trap? But as far as it being like, quote unquote, a good movie, no, it's it's not, it's, it's not at all. Hence why we were on Bad Movies in a Beat. Anywho, if you like this video, be sure to like this video. Oh. Oh, that's strong. Follow me on all my social media, Instagram and Twitter, both of which are Kenny JD. If you have any more bad movies that you'd like to recommend, feel free to put them down in the comment section and I will see you guys next time.